Hi, welcome to your Mac 200 statics online classes. My name is Dr. Diaz and in this video we continue through the content of chapter one. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. We finished the last video presenting the two systems of units to quantify the basic quantities of mechanics, the international system and the US customer system. From now on, our focus will be on the international system because it is intended to become the worldwide standard for measurements. We start with the application of prefixes to the units, which are useful to represent a quantity when it's a very large number or a very small number. Some of the prefixes used in the international system and their symbols are shown in this table right here. Each row represents a multiple or a submultiple of a unit which, when applied successively, it moves the decimal point of a quantity to every third place. The most used multiple prefixes are giga, which multiplies a number by 1 billion, mega, which multiplies a number by 1 million, and kilo, which multiplies a number by 1000. For the submultiple prefixes, we mostly use milli, which divides a number by 1000, micro, which divides a number by 1 million, and nano, which divides a number by 1 billion. I'll give you one example. 4 million newtons is equal to 4000 kilonewtons, which is equal to 4 meganewtons. Therefore, the application of prefix makes our lives much easier in representing the answers for the problems that we're going to work out here. We have now to highlight some important rules that describe the proper use of international system units and symbols. First of all, quantity is defined by several units, which are multiples of each other, should be separated by a dot to avoid confusion with the prefix notation. For example, when we decompose newtons into its basic units, we need to make sure that we put a dot between kilograms and meters per second squared. The same rule applies if you want to further decompose the velocity by putting a dot between meters and second to the power minus two. The next rule states that the exponential power appearing on a unit having a prefix refers to both the unit and its prefix. For example, to represent a result in micronewton squared, we have to keep in mind that it refers to micronewton times micronewton, not newton times newton. The third rule states that, in general, we should avoid the use of a prefix in the denominator of composite units. The only exception is for kilograms, which is a basic unit itself. One example is that we shouldn't write newtons per millimeters, but rather kilonewtons per meter. This notation is much easier to understand. And the fourth rule establishes that when performing calculations, we should represent the numbers in terms of their base or derived units by converting all prefixes to powers of 10. For example, when representing the multiplication between 50 kilonewtons and 60 nanometers, we should first convert the units to their base units, newton and millimeters, perform the multiplication, and represent the final result in terms of a single prefix. It's best to keep this numerical value between 0.1 and 1000, otherwise a suitable prefix should be used. Now, let's make some comments regarding the best practices we should follow in order to do numerical calculation in statics problems. First, it's worth mentioning that we are going to use handheld calculators and computers to perform most of the numerical work. But keep in mind that within the practice of engineering, it's always helpful to maintain some capability to perform simple, quick mental calculations especially to anticipate if the results we're getting make sense or not. Next, 
it's important to say that the answers to any problem should be reported with just file accuracy using the appropriate significant figures. We'll discuss this later in detail with some other important aspects involved in engineering calculations. The first thing we need to care about when solving any mathematical equation that represents a physical process is its dimension homogeneity, which means that we have to guarantee that each term of the equation is being expressed with the same units before we plug any numerical value into it. Let me give you one example of that. Consider this equation that describes the time variation of the position of a particle subject to an accelerated motion. If we are using the international system of units, then we have that S is the position of the particle in meters, T is the time in seconds, V is the velocity of the particle in meters per second, and A is the acceleration of the particle in meters per second square. By making sure that all quantities are properly expressed in terms of the basic units, the equation will maintain its dimension homogeneity regardless of the way we're going to solve it. In other words, we can solve it to calculate S or V or T, it doesn't matter. We will always have a consistent result in terms of units. The next stop is related to the number of significant figures we should use in order to represent a number with the appropriate accuracy. Significant figures are simply the non-zero numbers containing a number and we should pay attention if they appear at the beginning or at the end of the number. For that, we're going to make use of the so-called engineering notation to represent all quantities of interest and report results. This notation uses multiples of 10 raised to the power minus nine, minus six, minus three, three, six, and nine to express any numerical quantity. For example, if we want to represent the number 23,400, which has three significant figures located at the beginning of the number, using the engineering notation with the same three significant figures, then we should write it as 23.4 times 10 raised to the power 3. Let's consider the second example. If we want to represent this number, with three significant figures located at the end of the number, then we should report it at 0.582 times 10 raised to the power minus three, or simply 582 times 10 raised to the power minus six. The benefit of using the engineering notation is that it facilitates the application of prefixes, like in the previous example. If the number 0.582 times 10 raised to the power minus 3 is in meters, then we can represent it as 0.582 millimeters. Or if 582 times 10 raised to the power minus 6 is in meters, then the prefix notation would be 582 micrometers. The last talk we we'll cover is on how we should proceed on rounding off numbers. Rounding off numbers is important and necessary so that the accuracy of the result will be the same as that of the problem data. We usually follow two general rules to do it. The rule number one can be applied as any numerical figure ending in a number greater than five should be rounded up and a number less than five should not be rounded up. Let's consider the following example. We want to round off the number 3.5587 to three significant figures. We can see here that the fourth digit is eight, which is greater than five, and therefore the previous number is rounded up to six, and the result is 3.56. Likewise, if we want to do the same thing with 1.3419, we have to consider the fourth digit, which is less than five, and then we do not round the previous digit up, which results to 1.34. 
The second general rule states that if the digit preceding the 5 is an even number, then this digit is not rounded up. Otherwise, if the digit preceding the 5 is an odd number, then it is rounded up. For example, if what you get the number 75.25 rounded off to three significant digits, it becomes 75.2. Also, if you want to do the same for 0 0.1275, the result is 0 0.128. Now, I'd like to give you some useful recommendations for when you're performing calculations. A very helpful one is that when you're performing a sequence of calculations with multiple operations, it is best to store the intermediate results in the calculator memory without rounding them off, and then rounding off only the final answer. With this approach, you'll be keeping the precision of the final answer. Most of the scientific calculators available for engineers have a memory function, then it should not be a problem. The next recommendation is that you should always round off the answers to maximum three significant figures. With this, you can keep a reliable accuracy for most of the engineering mechanics data, such as geometry and loads. Finally, we are going to list here some tips that may help you to be successful on solving statics problems. Of course, that watching the videos, attending the lectures, reading the textbook, and studying the examples problems really helps. But the most effective way of learning the principles of statics is by solving problems. For this reason, I would like to list here a few tips. First, read the problem carefully and try to correlate the actual physical situation with the theory. Please, don't rush on it. Take your time to read the problem statement how many times you feel it's necessary. If you're not very sure about the theory, then go back to the book and review it carefully. You don't need to fully understand the problem when you read it for the first time. And believe me, the more time you spend trying to figure out the solution of a problem, the more you learn. Then try to tabulate the problem data and draw to a large scale any necessary diagrams. This also has to do with organization. Diagrams are very useful tools because they help us to visualize the problem and the possible solutions. With very good diagrams and being as neat as possible, you are going to reduce chances of doing mistakes during the calculation process. Next, you should be able to apply the relevant physical principles in the mathematical form. Analyze all quantities involved in a specific equation and check the quantities for which you have data and the ones you don't. And when write equation, don't forget to check if they are dimensionally homogeneous. After that, you can solve the necessary equations and report the answers with no more than three significant figures. We already emphasized this in the video. And finally, after getting your answer, think about it and use your technical judgment and common sense to determine if that answer seems reasonable or not. That's what we also call engineering judgment and should always keep practicing this for now on. Now, it's time to work on some examples. In the example 1.1, we are required to convert 2 kilometers per hour to meters per second and to feet per second. That's a pretty straightforward unit conversion problem, and we get the chance to apply some of the techniques we've learned in this chapter. To answer the first part of the question, we should remember that from the conversion factors for the SI units, 1 kilometer is equivalent to 1,000 meters and one hour is equivalent to 3,600 seconds. Then we have to arrange the conversion factors in such a way that we want to keep the ones we are interested on and cancel the ones we are not. I'll explain this further. 
First, we have to arrange the two kilometers per hour in a vertical form like this. Next, the conversion factor for the length is arranged in such a way that the kilometer unit stays in the denominator to cancel with the one in the numerator. Then we have to do the same thing for the conversion factor for the time by arranging its hour unit in the numerator to cancel with the hour unit in the denominator. Then we just do the math and we get the answer that is 0 0.556 meters per second. For the second part of the problem, we pretty much do the same thing, but taking the conversion factor from table one of the textbook, the same one presented at the end of the previous video, in which one foot is equivalent to 0 0.3048 meter. Then by arranging the conversion factor conveniently to cancel the meter unit and doing the math, we have the final answer that is 1.82 feet per second. Now, you should be able to study examples 1.2 and 1.3 of the textbook on your own. Carefully review the procedure given in this video and make sure that you can identify all the steps being applied throughout the solution of the examples. And with that, we have finished chapter one. Thanks for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.